Hi, I'm Mark Sanford. I began years ago in business. I went to the University of Virginia for business school. I worked in finance in New York. I had two stints in the U.S. Congress where, among other things, I served on the Budget Committee. For eight years, I was governor of South Carolina where, again, among other things, we cleaned up more than a billion dollar financial hole. And the point of all of this is that I have some degree of experience with budget and government finance. And, 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 and with that experience, I, I'm here just to say three things, all of which I promise to elaborate on. But first, let me just lay out these three thoughts. One, that principle number 11, that government must exercise responsible stewardship of public finances, lands, and other resources belonging to the people is in many ways the most important principle. Despite the borrowing binge that we've gone on here lately in Washington, over the long run, if you can't pay for it, you can't have it. And if you borrow long enough and in unsustainable fashion, as we are now in D.C., you're going to reap devastating financial consequences. This makes principle number 11 real important if one wants to avoid those devastating financial consequences. Two, that this principle of adhering to sustainable spending of finances has been ignored in Washington by Republicans and Democrats alike. The Trump administration sadly has taken financial recklessness to new highs, but equally sad is the fact that in the Democratic presidential primary, it seemed nothing more than a bidding war, more versus more. Where we're allowing politicians and political forces to take us here is not all that unusual in looking at the pages of history. Um, but what those same pages show is that to stay on this course will bring horrendous consequences for each one of us and for those that we love. It's vital that every one of us make our voices heard here in saying no more to excessive spending and borrowing. Three, and finally, we're walking our way toward the most predictable financial crisis in the history of man. Those aren't the words of some right-wing financial zealot, a merit badge I would proudly claim, but instead those are the words of Erskine Bowles, former chief of staff to President Clinton. Bowles co-headed the Bowles-Simpson Commission, and their assessment at its conclusion was dire. And indeed, our situation is just that if we do nothing. So let's, let's dig back into those three points and why this principle is so important. On the first point, our founding fathers studied history and saw what happened to civilizations that tried to pretend that math didn't matter. It was disastrous every single time. James Madison said, I go on the principle that a public debt is a public curse, and in a republic, a greater curse than any other. John Adams said, the consequences arising from the continual accumulation of public debts in other countries ought to admonish us to be careful to prevent the growth of it in our own. Alexander Hamilton said, nothing can affect national prosperity more than constant and systematic attention to extinguishing the debt. And Thomas Jefferson, as always, put it most succinctly, we must not let our rulers load us up with perpetual debt. This is not about lofty and principled claims of old guys that died long ago. It's about a principle that made our country great <clears throat> and is as alive today as it was when spoken by Thomas Jefferson hundreds of years ago. Making our country great again is not as easy as simply reciting a slogan. It's about adhering to the principles that made our country great, and this is a linchpin principle. Now, I say linchpin for three reasons, and I say it purposely. One, this is a moral principle. Our country was founded on the notion of no taxation without representation. The Bible lists not stealing as one of God's commandments. And yet, you know what a deficit is? It's nothing more than a deferred tax. It's handing the bill for today's government to my four sons or your kids or your grandchildren, and that isn't right. It's stealing them from them financial opportunities that would be theirs, and again, that's not right. What we leave our kids in financial, environmental, and other terms is not only a moral concept, it's probably the truest indication of what a society really believes when they talk about social equity. Two, 
It's a principle whose worth has been documented through the pages of history. History is literally littered with the skeletons of civilizations that have spent their way to death. On this front, I have a homework assignment for you, at least for those of you with insomnia. Read Reinhardt and Rogoff's book, This Time It's Different. Time and time again, civilizations got to a tipping point where they had to decide whether they went back to the principles that made them great or whether they stayed on a happy but ultimately unsustainable course of upward government spending and upward government consumption. Nine times out of ten, when confronted with the need to return to financial reality, politicians proclaimed, well, this time it's different. But math always worked, and those claims proved in every instance to be the nails in the coffin of that civilization. Let's not let that happen to America. But once again, doing nothing won't change our course. It's vital that you get involved here. Finally, you remember that movie, Jerry Maguire? In it, Tom Cruise plays the role of a beleaguered sports agent whose client at one point in frustration simply yells, show me the money. <laughs> there are a host of important things that government can and should do. But if these needs are crowded out by wasteful spending or interest costs in the national debt, there is no money to show for the things that we'd like for government to do. The degree to which we would like adequate funding for roads and for defense and health care and education will be crowded out by debt and deficits. And the degree to which politicians have set a dangerous course is underscored by two simple things. One, our debt is compounding exponentially, and this is unsustainable. In fact, Einstein was once asked, what's the most powerful force in the universe? And his reply was compound interest. It works while you sleep. Generally, unsustainable government spending has led to inflation, and this is the great robber of the middle class. In fact, when taken to the extreme, inflation wipes out the middle class and brings in a political strongman and criminal like Adolf Hitler, as it did in Germany after World War I. In fact, if you'd like to read more on this, please make it a point to read Adam Ferguson's book, When Money Dies. It is as, as sobering as it is real. And two, our government spending has 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 been leapfrogging lately. I mean, it's insane to look at the numbers. It, it took us about 200 years to accumulate $5 trillion in national debt. It doubled under President Bush as it went from 5 to 10. It doubled again under President Obama as it went from 10 to 20. And it is well on its way to doubling once again under the eight years it would mark a two-term Trump presidency. Now, sadly, Trump can go on and reap millions as a reality TV star. But this movie doesn't mean well for me and you. We will be left holding the bag just as subcontractors were at his Atlantic City casino where he defaulted on about a half a billion dollars a day. And it's only your voice that will change this. Finally, let me get back to my point that we are walking our way into a financial hurricane, the likes of which we've never seen unless we change course. Here are a few predictors of how close we are to this storm actually coming ashore. We have never been as vulnerable financially as we are now as a country. We've gone from being the biggest creditor to the biggest debtor nation. China owns about one quarter of the national debt held by foreign interests. Our debt level as a percentage of the economy is about where we are were when we were fighting the Japanese and the Germans for our very survival during World War II. Net worth numbers are bubbling as a result of the federal government and the Fed pouring money uh, any and everywhere. And, and it's higher now than it was just prior to the tech bubble meltdown in 2002 and the real estate collapse of 2008. In short, I'm telling you what you already know. Our government finances are a disaster. And we have a long list of disasters playing out in Washington as a result of people there turning their backs on the very principles that our founding fathers fought a revolution to institute. It all begs the question what each of us are going to do to turn this thing around before we lose this remarkable birthright our founding fathers gave us in a constitutionally balanced form of limited government. Now, we don't have to pledge our lives, our liberty, and our sacred honor, but we do have to step to the plate to avoid going the way that so many civilizations have gone before us. Benign neglect is not benign, it's cancerous. 
And it can only change with people getting in the game and saying enough is enough. It's my prayer that you'll do just that. You love your country? Get involved. Love your kids? Get involved. Love your community and friends? Get involved. The time is now. I hope you'll join us in pushing to reinstitute the principles that made our country great and in remembering how adhering to sensible and sustainable finances is one of those key principles. Take good care.